Hi guys, in this video I'm going to talk about generalized least squares and how they are different from ordinary least squares. So let's begin. Ordinary least squares assumes that we have a vector of y's. If we write it in, in matrix notation, we have a vector of y's equal to the design matrix times the vectors of coefficients plus the vectors of residuals or error terms. And what we assume is that the expectation of the error terms are equal to zero and that the covariance matrix of the error terms is a diagonal with the same amount of variance on each element of the diagonal, yeah? So each observation has the same amount of variance. What generalized least squares does, it relaxes this last assumption. We are no longer constrained to have this very restricted covariance structure it generalizes it to any covariance structures. So instead of the covariance of the residual will be equal to this, it will be equal to this, or sometimes it's written like this. And what does it mean? Well, so before we had that the elements in the covariance matrix were the same, and these are the variances. So the variances were the same, but now they are not the same. This means that we are losing this homoscedasticity assumptions, which means equal variance. So now some observations, uh, some points on our axes, yeah, might have small variances and some might have big variances and larger variances, okay? And the second thing is that before these off diagonal elements and this matrix has to be symmetric. So this is equal to this. Before this was zero, but now they are not zero. They can have some correlations. The error terms can have some correlations between them. So what this means is that we are losing the independence assumption. So we are no longer assuming that the observations uh, come independently out of each other. No, we are saying now it could be that there is some correlation structure. So what does it change? It changes that now the OLS estimated that we had from before, yeah, this thing over here, it's not as good as it can be. So it used to be the best estimators, uh, which is the B in blue. It used to be a blue estimator. It was the best linear unbiased estimator. So from all the unbiased estimators, from all the estimators that if you take their expectations, you get the true uh, vector of coefficients, it used to be the best. It used to be the one with the least variance. But now this is no longer the case. It is still unbiased. So even if you take uh, these assumptions over here, yeah? So if you scratch this assumption and you take this assumption now instead, well, this assumption still holds. So if you take this OLS estimator and you calculate the expectations, it's still equal to the real vector of coefficients. But the Gauss-Markov proof that the variance will be the best, it will be the least, is now ruined by this extra sigma term that we have here. So maybe I'll just do a quick recap. Yeah, so what the Gauss-Markov proof does, it assumes that there's another unbiased linear estimator, yeah? So it assumes that there's, it's linear with the y's, yeah? it's some combination of the y's. And it says, let's suppose it's equal to the hat metrics from the previous beta, plus some matrix that changes everything, that could change everything in this matrix. And it still has to be unbiased. So the expectation of that, once we open all the terms here, uh, it still has to be equal to the real beta. And we see we have this term here that kind of gets in the way. So what it means, we have to assume that this term is equal to zero. This, is, this happens here and this happens also in the OLS. But now there's a problem. When we calculate the variance of the new estimator, well, before we had these two terms, that we could cancel. Why? Because we didn't have these in between and X transpose, uh, here it should be also D transpose, and D times X, we already know that they are equal to zero from this assumption from before. But now they are no longer zero. So we have these new terms and we can no longer say with that uh, the variance of this is greater than the variance of this. Because before we had this and this is positive definite. So before we knew that the variance of the new estimator was equal to the variance of the OLS plus something. 
Okay, but now this is no longer the case. So what do we do to solve this? Um, one way of looking at things is to go back to the OLS assumptions and then get the blue estimators. So what we need to do is to remove the covariance structure, right? So we can do that if we multiply by the inverse of the matrix square root. Yeah, so we can take the square root of this matrix, sigma, and this exists due to the positive definiteness of sigma. And it also means that the square root is positive definite and unique. And there are various methods to take the square root of a matrix. Uh, in R, they use the Denman Beavers uh, method. In the end, we don't really need it, as we will see. But just knowing that it exists and it's unique. Also, we don't have to take the square root. We could also take a Cholesky decomposition looking forward, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so. The bottom line is that we can take the square root and we can also take the inverse, which again exists due to the positive definiteness of this square root matrix. And there's various methods to also uh, get the inverse of a matrix. And then what we do is we multiply all sides of this equation yeah, by this inverse of the square root matrix, which I denoted by this thing. And we get this expression over here. And then let's just name them differently. So this we will name y dash, and this we will name x dash, and this we will name epsilon dash. And now all of the OLS assumptions are met. Okay, so now this thing right now, its expectation is the expectation of this sigma times epsilon, which is equal to the sigma times the expectation of epsilon, which is equal to zero because this is equal to zero. And the variance of epsilon dash is equal to the variance of sigma dash times epsilon, which is equal to sigma dash times the variance of epsilon, which is sigma times sigma dash transpose. But sigma can be decomposed into sigma half and sigma half. And this is just sigma half minus one and this is sigma half minus one. So these all things cancel and we get the identity matrix. So now the OLS assumptions are met. The estimator of beta will be blue. We take the OLS estimator in this new uh, problem, in this problem, and we get that it's equal to this. If we plug in back what x dash and what y dash are, we get this. And then this thing is just sigma to the power of minus half times sigma to the power of minus half. So it's just sigma to minus one and the same here. And so this is the generalized least square solution. Yeah. So the only thing that difference is that we have this extra matrix here for the covariance. And so, so this is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at things is to understand how the covariance matrix changes distance of the optimization problem. So what is the optimization problem when we're doing OLS? We want to minimize the residuals vector. So we, we take the distance of the residual uh, vector squared, right? We take the epsilon transpose epsilon. So we take the square distance. It's basically, it's basically the squared norm. But this would be correct if we would be in, for example, a Euclidean space or in a space which is isotropic, where the distance in each axis is equal, where we care about the distance the same. Okay, but we are now in a space where some residuals are more important than others, right? So Epsilon is a vector of realization from some distributions, usually a normal distribution. And so it's no longer correct to measure this Euclidean distance. We need to measure the Mahalanobis distance. And I have a whole video about the Mahalanobis distance. I will link into this video. So before we measured this, right, the squared distance of the residual vector, and we expanded it to here, and then we took the minimum of this expression with regards to beta. Basically, we try to minimize this vector of residuals with regards to beta. This is equivalent if we have this, yeah, one residual here and one residual here. Let's suppose we only have two data points and two residuals. Then this is the distance. If we say we have, this is the point, yeah, one and one. And because the shape of the correlation structure between epsilon one and epsilon two is this isotropic, it's equal on all directions it means that if we take this square root two, yeah, because this is square root two distance in all directions, they will be the same. Okay. We will consider that the distance to be the same. 
But if now we have a covariance matrix, which is diagonal, it means that now the covariance structure is an axis aligned diagonal. Okay, so it could be that epsilon one, the first data point, well, we say there we have more variance. Yeah, we get more variance there. So we, we have this bigger variance on this axis. And epsilon two, usually the second data point comes, there's not so much variance there. We get very, very close results to each other. So this is the variance there. And now taking a step of one, uh, yeah, suppose this is one on this direction, it almost doesn't change your distribution. You are still in a high density level distribution, right? So let's suppose that this contour is two standard deviation from the mean. Yeah, so now here, so taking a step here, you are still very in a high density area, but taking a step of one here, you're already outside two standard deviations from the mean. So you are in a very low density area. So now taking a step of one is not equal on all directions. So if you take a step of one here, you are actually not moving so much. You are still in a high density area. Taking a step of one here takes you to a very low density area. Here takes you to somewhere in between, etc. And when you have a diagonal covariance, okay, so this is a diagonal covariance. This means that you have maybe A, B, C, D, yeah, and here all zero. It's also called weighted least squares because essentially what we are doing, we give each observation different weight. Okay, so uh, we can also write this as uh, this thing now, it's all, we can also write it like this. So we are giving each observation a weight that is inverted by the variance, inverted by the standard deviation. So if you have a small variance, you get bigger weight. So we want, if there's a small variance, we are saying, oh, we should really, you know, take more consideration to the residuals and try to minimize them. But if you have a larger variance, we give it a smaller weight because we say, okay, in this area, there's a lot of variance. So it doesn't matter if the residuals are so uh, big for this area. And here's an example of a graph I plotted. In orange is the true line that created this data. In red is the OLS solution, and in blue is the GLS or WLS, because here it's just a diagonal covariance. And you can see from the data that the variance starts to get bigger and bigger. The problem of using OLS is that in this case, we had more, we had more residuals in this area than in this area. So it says, oh, I have to adjust for it. And so it pushes the line more down, yeah, it pushes the line more down and here it pushes it more up and we get this uh, solution. In GLS or WS in this case, we see that it's overall better fit to the orange line. And the reason for that is that it looks here and it says, okay, yeah, there are more residuals here and it does account for it. We see that it still is more down than the true line, but it doesn't account for it that much because it says, okay, here it's an area of larger variance so I will not give it so much weight. So this is why the blue line is an overall better fit, yeah, as we see compared to the true line that generated the data than the OLS solution. And now what happens if sigma is full rank? So it's not just a diagonal, there's elements also in the off diagonal, we get a non-axis aligned ellipsoid. So we get something like this. And again, we take the same distance. This distance is not the same as the distance here. Here we can see that we are still not outside the two standard deviation, right? But here we are already outside the two standard deviation. And taking a step in this direction is not the same as taking a step in this direction, and it's not the same as taking a step in this direction. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to calculate the Mahalanobis distance that takes into consideration this correlation structure. And this will be the same as moving back to this isotropic space. What will happen, it will squash everything. Yeah? So this will become more like this, and this will become bigger, okay? And so if we calculate the Mahalanobis distance, well, we have to go back to isotropic space on each of the epsilon, then take the distance there. This is equal to this, which is equal to this. And now if we want to minimize beta, we'll expand this term to this, 
we'll take a derivative with regards to beta, we'll get this, we'll equate to zero, and we get this, which is the same solution as before. Okay, so this is all for this video. I hope you enjoy it and see you in the next one.